we are here to talk about how we can examine dominant white culture in citizen and community science. Um, and it's a re representative team from the UK and the US from the Learn Sit Sci project, which is a National Science Foundation and Wellcome Trust funded uh, research grant looking at the learning outcomes of youth engaged in community and citizen science at natural history museums. So I just wanted to make sure that um, you all know that we fully support you taking care of your needs right now. We understand that there are small children maybe in the room with you. I think I could hear one. How perfect timing was that? Um, and you may have uh, physical or mental or emotional needs that you need to take care of during this time. Um, and we fully support that. If you need to have your uh, video off for accessibility, maybe you've been on a lot of Zoom calls or video calls today. Um, we, we totally understand. We love seeing your faces um, uh, and engaging with you that way, but we also get that not everyone has that ability right now. We do have two folks on the call who are gonna help with tech today. Uh, we have Victoria Burton and Annie Miller and feel free to direct message them if you have any technical issues and need anything. And we will try to, to meet your needs today. So now for a quick round of introductions on presenter side, and then we'll move over to doing some kind of chat intros for, for you all. We wish we could do introductions verbally, but we wouldn't be able to get through um, any of our content uh, if we did that. Um, so what we're gonna do, I'm gonna just model for our team, say a name, where you work, what role you are in community science, citizen science, and, a very short sentence of how you got into um, your way into anti-racist work. So hi, I'm Leela Higgins. I'm the senior manager for community science at the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles. Um, a Co-PI on the Learn Sit Sci Research Grant. And about five years ago, I joined a group in Los Angeles called White People for Black Lives, which works in solidarity um, with Black Lives Matter Los Angeles and works towards abolition and that was kind of really my way in. Michelle, we'll just go down the line. Michelle, over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Michelle Race. I am a manager uh, for the Community Science Program at the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles. Um, conversations around race and racism um, are not unfamiliar to me, as I am sure they're not unfamiliar to many Black, Indigenous people of color. Um, but I really found my way into this work formally when I joined the Community Science Program at the Natural History Museum. So I've been working with my team for about a year and a half on this. So that was my way in. Thanks. So I'll pass it over to Jess. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Jess Wardlaw. I'm Interim Citizen Science Manager at the Natural History Museum in London. And my work in this area really began um, probably about 10 years ago when I was at the University of Nottingham. I was in the on the Faculty of Engineering's um, Athena Swan Working Group, the Equality, Diversity and Inclusivity Board, um, looking to promote um, STEM careers amongst underrepresented groups. And I've been working very actively with my colleagues here on this call within the Learn Sit Sci project, which you'll be hearing a lot more about on anti-racist work. And I will pass over to Jess C. as opposed to Jess. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Jessie. I am one of the community science coordinators at the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles. I work with Leela and Michelle. Um, kind of like <laughs> Michelle, I've always been interested and always been a part of anti-racism work. Um, I am half Colombian and uh, a lot of my family, more so than I am because of my mixedness, um, are usually victims to white supremacy uh, culture and also just the racism in daily life. Um, and I've had a lot of ability to use my privilege to kind of either help my family or friends. Um, and I think a lot of my anti-racism work or knowledge and having the actual wording or terminology to support 
people in my community and in my life came from being a part of the community science team uh, at the Natural History Museum. And I've been with them for about three years. Thanks, um, Jesse. Yeah. Were you gonna introduce uh, Sasha, who's not here with us, but did significant work on this? Yeah, I just wanted, to, yeah, if you don't mind, um, Sasha was one of my colleagues with the Learn Sit Side program, and she is one of the most amazing and talented people I know. Um, and she's she is not going to be here with us today. Um, I know that she has a lot on her plate right now, and she actually already left the Learn Sit Side team last year. Um, and she dealt with a lot of issues within the program, of some that we're going to be talking about. Um, and she has had a history in museums for over 10 years, um, museums and nonprofits and her, kind of like her anti-racism work has been her whole life and her activism work has been her whole life. Um, so I hope, I don't know if there's anything I missed, Leela. I don't think so. Thank you so much for that introduction of Sasha. Um, so again, her work influenced, her opinions and thoughts influenced um, the development of this program as well. We wanted to make sure we, we honored her as we started out today. So if um, we would love to get to know you all a little bit uh, and if you could in the chat box, put your name, what city you're living in, uh, what role you play in community slash citizen science. You can add your organization if you would like as well. Um, though we are not defined by our organizations. We, we are influenced by them obviously. And then as a quick icebreaker question, do you prefer coffee or tea? Hmm. I see some folks in the chat. Oh, we got uh, uh, Shyam from India, from L Nalanda University. We've got Marta from Lisbon, Portugal. Sarah Staunton Lamb saying, sorry, her screen is off, trying to juggle family. We totally understand. Thank you for joining us. I saw somebody in Bhutan. Great. Um, and we have uh, uh, Sharon, yeah, an agenda and inclusion advocate in, in Bhutan, which um, sounds fantastic. Thank you for joining us. Um, Megan Gordon from Montpellier, Vermont, drinking coffee right now. Jess, you said coffee. I drank my tea already. So even as a British person living in America, still, still, still the tea all the time. Shelly Temple King from Sacramento, coffee. Vanessa from Paris, living in Croatia, definitely tea. Andeep Sangera from London, Marine Conservation Society, mix of coffee and chai, cough chai. Ooh, I'm gonna have to try that. Um, Nadia, from Birmingham, Volunteer Development Officer for the Royal Society and Protection of Birds. Excellent, thanks for joining us. Daniela Peterson, Chattanooga, work for the Trust for Public Land, another from the East Coast. This time works pretty well for East Coasters as well as European uh, Citizen Science Association members. So thanks for joining us, all the East Coast folks. Uh, Chris from Denver, communications professional, drinking some Tulsi right now. Michelle is drinking coffee this morning, it's early. Anna from Berlin, no role in community science, but interest in combating white supremacy culture in federal museums and ethological museums, tea. Yeah, museums, we have a lot of issues. Um, Jen Epstein, live in Beacon, New York, work through the Hudson River, coffee in the morning, tea in the afternoon. Georg from Hungary, organization is ESSRG, member of EXA, coffee is the favorite. Wow, so many, thank you all. Um, just a reminder to do, you could not, instead of direct messaging anyone, do this to everyone, because Jennifer Gilbraith, um, I just wanna make sure that everyone gets the chance to know that you're here from North Carolina, Nags Head, Nature Conservancy. Uh, Rick Hall from Nottingham, education charity called Ignite and coffee. 
Thank you all so much for Diego Huerta, master's student, community-based participatory research at the University of Arizona in the environmental science department and T for sure. Um, I wish I could read out all of them. I wish we could do face-to-face -face introductions. We are gonna have time for breakout rooms, so we will be able to have and um, be in conversation and dialogue together. Okay, so now we're gonna move into a grounding for this workshop. Jesse, if you could uh, do our land acknowledgement, please. Yeah, of course. So we're gonna read the land acknowledgement that our office uses in Los Angeles. Um, so this land acknowledgement was created by the UCLA land acknowledgement um, and they have on their website with a link that I think we're gonna be sharing. Thank you, Victoria, in the chat. And so I'm gonna read it out loud to you guys. We acknowledge the Tongva peoples as traditional land caretakers of the Los Angeles Basin and Southern Channel Islands. We pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and our relatives, past, present, and emerging. Jesse, this, this slide's yours too. Oh, this is, oh, sorry. Thank you very much. Oh, so yeah, this is the grounding. Um, so we do realize that the topic that we're gonna be addressing and what we're gonna be talking about is going to be very uncomfortable for a lot of people. Um, so we do want to acknowledge that discomfort and let people know that there's a reason for that discomfort and I implore you to sit with it. There's nothing really wrong with that discomfort. Part of that deals with um, just white fragility and just understanding that this is an issue that needs to be tackled. And a lot of people don't like to address it and they don't like to be uncomfortable, but this is how we grow and this is how we learn. Um, so for the grounding here is, yes, there's gonna be a lot of discomfort, we ask that you be reflective on this, that discomfort and we ask you to be vulnerable. And we wanna acknowledge that a lot of people in our team are being vulnerable in sharing their stories and in sharing their um, value, like their input and what the work they've been doing for so long. Thank you, Leela. Okay, um, and to follow up on that grounding, um, I'm going to read some communication guidelines that can help us through this work. Um, it's authored by Aware LA, and I think that link is going to be shared in the chat. Yeah, thank you, Annie. Um, and so I'll read through here, but there's further context in that document if you need any explanation about any of these points. Okay, so our communication guidelines will be to welcome multiple viewpoints points, own your intentions and your impacts, work to recognize your privileges, take risks, lean into discomfort, make space, notice and name group dynamics in the moment, actively listen, challenging with care, which is that one is find ways to respectfully challenge others and be open to the challenges of your own views. I had to relook at that one earlier today. Um, Confidentiality, share the message and not the messenger and break it down. So again, if you need more context, you can find that link um, and we'll be using these guidelines to help us through this work today. Is this one me, Leela? <laughs> Um, so we thought we'd start by offering you the opportunity just to share with us in the chat what um, the term white supremacy culture means to you. And I'm not going to say anything more than that in case it influences your responses. And we'll check in in a, a minute or so. Let's give you some time to give that some thought.
Okay, in case the um, chat starts moving too fast, I'll um, read out some of them. Um, we've got from Cassandra, prioritizing white people, their feelings, values, and culture. Um, Sanjay tends to agree the needs of white people are put ahead of others. Um, yeah, sharing says, um, from the development work perspective, organizations who, that value knowledge papers written by white people. Um, we got Chris saying societies, organizations and institutions are built in a way that raises white values and normalizes white methodologies while oppressing other customs, cultures, values and methodologies. Um, Dominic says this term has many aspects, which I think we're discovering in the chat. Um, white culture is the norm, says Sarah. Uh, cultural oppression, says Laura. By one group over all the others. Uh, and Lucy said, this time last year, she'd have thought of it as um, written first type attitudes. Um, but she's learned a lot over the last year and, can see, and now sees it as more that the Western world is geared up to a white is better attitude and mode of operating. That's brilliant. Thank you everybody for, for sharing. Um, I'm now going to um, give you some briefing on the definition that we as a group have been using as white supremacy culture. And I say that in full awareness and acknowledgement that I'm a white woman. So um, I, I always let that sit with me whenever I'm talking about this subject. Um, so this definition of white supremacy culture that we will use is one I've only discovered in the last year because I think a bit like Lucy I would have had more of a conception that white supremacy equaled far right leaning politics ideas um, but the one that we use I've learned through the Learn Sit Side project and the collaboration that the Natural History Museum in London has been doing with the California Academy of Sciences and the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County on this work and Oxford and Open University in the UK. So this definition encapsulates the cultural characteristics of organisations that make it so difficult um, to open the door to other cultural norms and standards. And if we can move to the next slide. And these are some of the characteristics. We've got a link in the bottom corner of this slide that I'm hoping Annie or Victoria can share with you to read later. It's not very long and it's very accessible, but um, it, it basically goes through these characteristics of white supremacy culture um, in a way to define what we mean by it. And um, we've got things like perfectionism, defensiveness, worship of the written word, either or thinking, a sense of urgency, um, qu quantity over quality, power hoarding, um, yes, and if you would like to share with us in the chat what um, how this these characteristics resonate with you, that would be great. I think Lee is trying to encourage you there. So these characteristics are listed because they are damaging. And because they're used as norm norms and standards without proactively um, being named or chosen by the group. So they're almost like an unconscious um, 
they're the unconscious characteristics of an organization and they promote supremacist uh, supremacy thinking and they're damaging to both people of color and to white people as we'll discover um so organizations led by people of color can show these characteristics just as equal it's equally as possible for an organization led by people of color to have these characteristics so we're going to look at just a few because of the time um a few that we've highlighted here um defensiveness which in the context of white supremacy culture refers to the energy an organization invests in trying to protect power from any criticism and people's feelings. And the next one. Fear of open conflict. So those in power are scared of conflict, so tend to ignore it and respond in a way that sends a message that people who raise issues are being awkward or out of line. A sense of urgency is um, a continued sense of urgency that inhibits and is used as an excuse um, for a lack of inclusive decision making and learning from mistakes. And finally, power hoarding. I'm going to highlight, I think this one. When we were um, compiling this workshop, this one particularly resonated with our group. That very little power is shared because there's no value seen in that. And those with power can be defensive and take it personally if any change is suggested. Yeah, you know, the belief that there is anything such as objective. Yeah, that was a someone had asked specifically about the objectivity one, and so oh, okay. I was just thanks give an example. Yeah, and I I liked this gra graphic because it kind of illustrates what a culture can be. That the longer you swim in it, the the more invisible it becomes, and that's really at the heart of um, what we're talking about today. So now we have some time for questions. And we also had some internal conversation about this graphic and how it might come off or people might feel differently about it and may not feel like swimming in a culture, it becomes invisible to them depending on what your background is. So if anyone has questions, you can unmute yourself and ask us. You could also ask in the chat if you feel more comfortable that, that way. Someone had specifically asked about the objectivity um, characteristic. And I wrote in the first bullet point from the document, which is the belief that there is such a thing as being objective. Um, but there's also uh, one that I really personally like about requiring people to think in a linear fashion and ignoring or invalidating those who think in other ways. As a person who I tend to be very nonlinear sometimes, um, it can be challenging, especially working with a lot of, I work in a research and collections department and there's a lot of uh, white male scientists who have their, a lot of their career in life is based on being very linear. Um, and being able to go from point A to point B and go through the scientific process and answer their questions. And I sometimes find that very challenging for me personally to, um, oh, oh dear, I just went forward a lot of slides, accidental. Um, previews, guys, previews. Just give a little bit more space for any questions. Uh, 
I really like what Claire uh, just wrote, and I saw Jesse nodding. Um, the invisibility of culture is an interesting question. I guess for people existing in a hostile culture, that might not be the case. Okay. Again, we will have time for in talking and interaction. <clears throat> so now we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about how we um, specifically uh, embarked on this anti-racism work on the Learn Sit Sci team. Um, so a lot of this, we really started ramping up this work after um, the murders of F George Floyd here by police in the United States and before that Breonna Taylor and the vigilante violence and killing of Ahmaud Arbery. And there, as you all know, there was an uprising here in the US, which then spread all around the world. Um, there was a lot of thoughts and feelings on the people on our team, in our museum office, and we engaged in shutdown STEM, which Michelle will talk a little bit about the work that's come out of our office from that time but we were we really need to bring this up with the learn sit side team as well and so we started doing this work in around um, June and July of last year and I just wanted to include this quote from Brian Nord who's one of the organizers with shutdown stem because um, this resonates with quite a few of us maybe in our museum settings I don't want more diversity and inclusion seminars those activities are used to provide a shield to institutions so they can do the bare minimum. So this is the outline of the process that we took in the Learn Sit Sci team. Um, we had a lot of foundational anti-racism reading to do. Um, not all of us were on the same page uh, with our language and understanding of um, what race and racism means in our respective countries. And uh, we then worked through uh, mapping oppressions on our team and then working towards antidotes. The white supremacy culture document um, outlines antidotes for each of the characteristics. And we used that model to figure out uh, antidotes for this on our team. And then we're in the phase of creating a plan for implementing those antidotes. Um, in the anti-racism readings and foundational work, which we're sharing a document with you um, about what those readings were, if uh, you want to use it as a model, um, many of you are probably very familiar with, with some of the readings. Um, one of the things that uh, I worked in collaboration with the BIPOC members of our team to create the reading list, um, and one of the things that Sasha was very, 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 um, you know, she's like, we have to have readings on microaggressions. Um, and so we had a number of readings and um, many of you on the call are probably familiar with what microaggressions are, have um, been maybe on the receiving end, um, but some of you may not be. Uh, they're the brief everyday slights, insults, indignities, and denigrating messages sent to people of color, also to LGBTQIA plus folks, people with disabilities, immigrants, people who are oppressed um, on different measures and maybe intersectionally as well, by well-intentioned people who are unaware of the hidden messages being communicated. That's a definition by Dr. Daryl Wing Sue from Columbia. Um, and so, uh, Sasha was very like emphatically, we have to share this in the talk today. So I think Annie shared the list and then we went through and each of us, we put a number of prompts on a jam board. We will be doing this together. And, um, we then mapped what oppressions we had experienced or witnessed ourselves on our team and went through and, um, specifically then coded them and worked towards theming them about what the issues really were. These were the prompts that we used. 
What were your expectations coming onto the Learn Sit Sci team project? How have they been met or not met? When have you felt not seen or heard on the Learn Sit Sci project? After we created the group norms, AKA communication guidelines for our team, do you feel like our work culture and or communication got better? Why or why not? Prompt four, what characteristics of the white supremacy culture has the Learn Sit Sci project upheld? Share example. Prompt five, describe a time when you have experienced or witnessed a microaggression during the Learn Sit Sci project. Prompt six, have you experienced or witnessed any other implicit or explicit racism on the Learn Sit Sci project? So now we're gonna share a few of the ones that uh, we wrote or really resonated with us. Jesse, I think this one's you first. Yeah, no, so this one's definitely, um, this is one, one of the ones that I've shared um, for one of my impressions. And I was very excited to be part of this project because there seemed to be a heavy emphasis in the job application uh, regarding equity and community outreach. Um, once being on the project in my three years on, you know, on the project, I felt like the term equity was more used as a keyword to get the grant. It, itself um, and to go to conferences um, and that there was no real focus on equity or doing equitable outreach and um, the PCOs, the people who were at the bottom who were doing the data collection uh, had to fight for the community organizations that we tried to pair with and tried to fight in making it more equitable. Um, one of the, yeah, so it's just, that was my, one of the impressions that I wanted to share. It looks like this one, is this Sasha's? Yeah. So I'm, Sasha, unfortunately, couldn't make it today. She said she was very busy, but she also um, talked to me on what she wanted to share. And she mentioned that this project was probably one of the most traumatic jobs for her and I know that this, this was very hard for her into wanting to come back and talk about a lot of the trauma that she went through. Um, she dealt with a lot of microaggressions in this project and she dealt with a lot of um, overt aggressions as well um, and we tried to draw addressing it for approximately two years and it wasn't until the protest in, Los, in the United States happened that people started pouring from our project um, support of BLM. When ironically, a lot of them were perpetuators of those micro, microaggressions towards her. Um, so then after that in trying to do this, uh, she felt, and I did too, uh, that there was a lack of urgency for tackling uh, racism and just the white supremacy culture in the project itself for Learn Sit Sci. There's also the added thing, and this is something that has been said to her as well when she was part of the project, that racism is not really a UK issue, it's mostly an American issue. And I know that um, just from a lot of my other friends who are also in Europe or residing in different areas, that Racism and white supremacy does seem to be very much of an American issue. But if someone's saying that, you got to also kind of look at why they're saying that, like in response to what? If someone's bringing up racism in their workplace and they're saying that it's an American issue, it's not really there, it's usually a defensive response. Thank you, Leila. Thanks, Jesse. Um, so this is one of the ones that I wrote um, and not recognizing calling out the leadership team of this grant when, when not recognizing and realizing that the leadership team of this grant when it was put together was all white, predominantly white women and not actively recognizing the need and the way it would have benefited our project to include more diversity on the principal investigator team. And as one of those people who worked on writing this grant, this app squarely sits on my shoulders. And this is the one that I um, 
picked out of all our the oppressions um and it really speaks back to um the experience that sasha had of microaggressions i um i know and i and other several members of the team would um try to raise things privately and not get answers and then when they raised the questions in public they were told that that was not the right place to do it um so yeah that was quite hard to handle especially when the questions were around precisely what we're talking about today and the inclusivity of the project Thanks, Jess. So now we're going to head into the breakout portion of um, the first of two breakout portions. Um, we are going to be uh, randomly assigning you to groups of six, and um, we're going to be dropping a link to the jam board that we've created. And um, depending on what breakout room you are in, you will be given a prompt on the jam board and be able to write out any um, oppressions or white supremacy culture characteristics that you have witnessed or seen. So if folks could um, click on the Jamboard and head over there. In a moment, Annie will be splitting us up into breakout rooms of about six. I see we have folks coming back. I really apologize for the Jamboard not being able to handle the numbers. That is not something we anticipated. We've come up with an alternate solution that hopefully will work for the next round. Um, I do see that some folks were able to get into the Jamboard and really appreciate that. And I hope you had some productive conversations in your in your groups. Um, if we could ask for two to three volunteers, Annie, is everyone back? Perfect, thanks. If we could ask for two to three volunteers to share um, some of the oppressions that your group came up with or like a theme of oppression maybe or something that really struck you, that would be great. It looks like Lacey uh, raised their hand. Great, thanks, Jesse. Lacey. Hi, uh, so our group spent a lot of time talking about um, inequalities and in the partnerships between um, sort of the leaders of the participatory science project and the people with whom they are working. Um, there's, um, in some ways this can be done with like data collection or science as a form of resource extraction, right? When you come to a community and you take data or um, knowledge or something from that community and use it to publish papers or to do things that are of value to the scientific community that may or may not be of value to the uh, community with whom you're working, especially if that even that information is not shared with them appropriately. And so we spent a lot of time talking about how to do citizen and community science in a way that's not um, just crowdsourcing data, but actually involves the community and cares about their needs and their perspectives. Thanks, Lacey. Anyone else um, want to share something from their group? I think the raise hand function works well, but if you just want to unmute. We have, um, Flora in the chat as well. They shared um, what they said in their breakout session. 
um, from total opposite backgrounds, yet we all experience microaggressions due to various different reasons. Yeah, I mean, sorry, if you want me to, I can elaborate a little bit on that because it was like really interesting because um, I think in our breakout room, there was just like one male and all the others were women. And we were all kind of like from different backgrounds with the, uh, different demographics. Um, but we all managed to, to list all the microaggressions we all experienced. And it was like really... Uh, intriguing to see that and acknowledge that because one person pointed out that um, they are not being taken seriously because they are like from the Western world. Me, one on the other hand, I'm personally not being taken seriously because I am not from the Western world. And it all kind of like just connected it together. Like, even though we are from the total opposite demographics and total opposite backgrounds, we still experience microaggression. And for me, it was like really interesting. Thanks, Flora, and thanks, Jesse, for it's hard to see all the different screens when you're sharing your own screen. One that struck me was from great breakout room four, um, not thinking or having a plan for community scientists who are experiencing racism or bias in the field. So we're just going to take a short break, a bio break or a mental break if you need it um, for around the next four minutes or so. And um, we'll come back and continue in four minutes. So at 8.06. If you wanna ask questions or make comments in the chat box while we're breaking yeah we're all here um if you would like to send questions okay um so now that we're back from that short break um we're moved into discussions about the antidote so Jesse, yeah. over to you. Okay, so um, with all the different types of oppression that we put in the jam board um, and what we have done in the past with Learn Sit Sai, we were then able to take the different types of examples that people shared and then break them into the different types of oppression that Jess shared early on in the slides in the in the workshop. Uh, once we were able to separate it from there, we were able to then use the um, the the prompt from um, dismantling racism and the white characters of white supremacy culture to then look towards antidotes and figure out what that might be. Uh, within our own uh, team for Learn Sit Sci, what we did was we broke down each uh, term of oppression in an Excel sheet. And then we then further went and we basically then put the types of antidotes. So with the worksheet that was shared earlier, um, they have multiple types of antidotes. And in this one, specifically the defensiveness antidote, we chose three from there where understanding that structure cannot in and of itself facilitate or prevent abuse. Um, and so we kind of matched it and then tried to see what we can do as a team, if we can do something as a team um, to combat those, that defensiveness or fall within that antidote. And then we had a voting on it. Um, so with, Defensiveness, we had some like working on our own defensiveness. So kind of like waiting and pausing and figure out why we're being defensive um, when someone's expressing um, anything that they might be, any form of abuse that they might be um, having or being victim of within the project. With the next slide. Um, 
Okay, thank you. Uh, so fear of open conflict. So just like Jess mentioned um, with her um, oppression that everything was had to be behind closed doors. Uh, there wasn't allow an allowance to say this out loud. Um, there is a lot of fear that goes with open conflict and you know distinguishing between being polite and raising a hard issue. Um, there has been moments when we would say something out loud to the team where it then was like no this is this has to be internal and this is something that I think also within our own museum um, outside of the project that we work with our um, executive board of wanting to keep things internally um, so and one of the antidotes here is realizing those differences and that transparency and the importance of that transparency that kind of goes with open conflict and how that allows for a quicker healing process, but also everyone to grow and move forward. If we go to the, thank you. And then the, the next one is a sense of urgency. Um, I'm sure a lot of you guys with your, your work plans um, and especially with Lawrence at Sai, uh, we have a tendency to bite off more than we can chew. Um, and so having realistic work plans and like real realistic work plans, because there's sometimes we're like, is this realistic? And we think we can do it. And then, still feeling stressed and that sense of urgency of needing to fit a deadline. Um, and that can be not only detrimental to like mental health, but also to the overall team um, effort of wanting to get things uh, done and funding and proposals and realizing that there has to be a realistic timeline and understand that even now with that realistic timeline that a lot of us are also having to deal with other um, outside things, especially with during a pandemic, most of us are working at home, having our kids at home, or having to deal with other outside factors. So a realistic work plan, but also one that's mindful of all these other types of intersectionalities that are now mixed in with that. Yes, okay, so this is another one that we decided to focus on as well, was power hoarding. Um, and so with our, with Learn Sit Sai, we discussed um, from the bottom up instead of from the top down, uh, what good leadership is for us and what we were looking for in our leaders and in the people who were above us and being able to have that conversation. And that kind of goes once again to the defensiveness and that vulnerability that we've talked about earlier. And it does take a lot of vulnerability and openness from both sides and being able to want to exert, exert that, um, those conversations or exert that energy because for a lot of BIPOC, that does take so many spoons and so much energy to even open and leave yourself that vulnerable. Um, so having those conversations, being able to address the power hoarding and even actually changing the way that things are structured um, and how you communicate that. So for our museum uh, with Leela and Michelle, we actually have a rotating chair head um, that each person is able to lead a meeting and it's you know um, optional. So you can like opt into it if you decide that you wanna do it. All right, so these, so this is the themes of like well-being of staff and just prioritizing that well-being of staff. So that goes with so many other forms of the antidotes that we're talking about and how we choose to prioritize them as a theme of oppression that came up on the Jamboard session and then kind of an overarching antidote will be top priority. And then we worked as a team to brainstorm to make that a reality underneath. And that kind of shows in the format in the next slide of what that looks like for our team with Learn Sit Sci. So this was a screenshot from our Excel sheet where you can see how it's broken down into actionable items and even a timeline of what we can do for to make those happen. And for each um, item or for each theme, we actually broke it up into different groups and we had people sign up for those different groups. And then we basically gave an, a timeline of how many meetings will be necessary to make each of these 
antidotes possible or how we can try to work towards solving them. Um, and I think that is it. Thanks, Jesse. Um, so we are now gonna move into our second round of um, breakout rooms. And because the Jamboard is apparently limited in the number of people that can go in, we've also made a uh, Google Doc where folks can add in ideas for antidotes. And um, if you didn't get a chance to add oppressions um, to the prompts last round, then you can do that now. So um, Annie's gonna put us into breakout rooms of six or so again, and um, we're gonna sh share both the Jamboard and the Google Doc. Um, and so we apologize for not noticing that there was a limit for how many people the Jamboard can handle. And we'll have 15 minutes for this breakout session as well. We'll be here if you've got any questions about this. Okay, I see folks coming back. Um, thank you all. Um, it's great to see when the Jamboard worked, it works really well. So I'm um, just gonna read out a few from breakout room two, some of the antidotes. I think the one, uh, I'm also sharing my screen. Can you see my screen? Oh, thanks, Jesse and everyone. Um, Start by listening, often very good advice. Pay people for their time. Don't tell folks what their community needs, ask them what they want. Credit organizations and individuals who are key contributors. Allocate funding with a grant bid to diversity or partnerships, job role to the community groups um, and provide travel costs relating to that relationship so that you have resources to genuinely achieve your goals. Advocate for funding agencies to require community partnerships. View communities as partners rather than as data collectors. Network with people and groups outside of our normal circles so that when it comes to writing a funding proposal or creating a project, relationships with a diverse range of stakeholders are already in existence and can be built upon. And there was one from this next slide. Try to make a solution rather than avoid a problem for fear of doing something wrong. That one's very, very telling. Okay, going back to the presentation. We're now gonna switch gears again. And let me put on the closed captioning. And Michelle and uh, Jess are gonna talk about the work that we've done in our natural history museums specific to our community and citizen science programs there. So Michelle, over to you. All right. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna share a little bit about the anti-racist work that's been happening with the community science program at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. Um, I'm gonna start with a little bit of a background before I jump straight into the anti-racist work that we've been doing recently. Um, beginning with our philosophy, which is represented by the image on this slide. Um, so the philosophy at our office is that we always want to keep in balance the scientific goals of our research scientists and the institution um, with, on the other four stones you can see, we're balancing it with fun, dignity, learning, and community of our participants. And so we never want those to be out of balance, and we value those both equally. Um, next slide, Lula. Thank you. And so what that philosophy did is really prime us to do diversity, equity, um, accessibility and inclusion work. Um, and it helped us kind of tackle a problem that the office started to see really early on, which is represented by this image. So the image on this slide 
is one of the most common types of images that comes up when you Google or search for citizen science. Um, and the problem with this image is that it doesn't fully represent the diversity of people that we want to work with and serve. Um, and it doesn't represent what the Los Angeles community looks like. Um, so we tried to tackle that early on. And so among lots of other ways that we tried to tackle that, um, one of the most public things that we did was change the name of our program from citizen science to community science. Um, and the reason we did that is, as we know, citizen can refer to um, a person that lives in a place, but it can also connotate or have connotations about the legal ability for someone to be in a place or live in a place. Um, and because that has nothing to do with our program, it made sense for us to change the name to community. And for me, this is always a personal reminder about who we hope to serve and hopefully a signal to our community that this is a place for them and that they can join our programs. Okay, so more specifically, the anti-racist work that we have been doing has come into focus, as Lila mentioned before, um, because our institution participated in shutdown STEM. And shutdown STEM, as Lila mentioned, was in response to social uprisings um, and a call to do something for anti-Black racism. So this happened on June 10th of last year. Um, and it was to take a day away from our day-to-day -day activities and make a plan for how we'll act to eliminate anti-Black racism. And our team took that very seriously. Um, we started at 9.30 in the morning and worked until 3, coming up with plans, sharing our stories, um, and seeing how we could move forward with this work. And so on this slide, um, you can see kind of our plan and a little bit of our progress from that day. Um, so you can see that we started there in June. And so we stopped or we put a pause on our programming um, and really focused on anti-racism. There were seven people on our team at the time and we wanted to know how could we make the biggest impact. And so one of the first decisions that we made was to start a weekly anti-racist meeting. So we have those every Wednesday since shutdown STEM. Um, and I know that one of the um, challenges that people have is saying that there isn't time for this kind of work. And I think that we found that by making a time an hour and a half every week, we're able to do our kind of more you know, regular tasks, if that's how we want to phrase it, um, and make time to stay focused on this. And so two things that we did initially was to create a new anti-racist philosophy, which I'll show you, and an anti-racist um, pledge. Okay, so the first thing we did was create an anti-racist philosophy. So similar to our original philosophy, this was um, to help us guide our work. So I just wanna read out this statement that is at the beginning of our philosophy. It says the goal of the NHMLAC community science anti-racist philosophy statement is to instill an actively anti-racist culture in our office. We acknowledge that we have been negligent and not, explicit, and not being explicitly anti-racist in the past, and we now commit to examining and re-engineering our programs, partnerships, research agendas, and communications to stop the perpetuation of white supremacy culture. Um, so on this slide, I know it's hard to see. Um, I think that we're gonna share out a link so you all can read our philosophy in detail, should you wish. Um, but it shows that we broke um, our goals down into a couple of categories. So our convictions, our focus, how we're gonna to commit to sustained action, um, the importance of involving a mix of peoples, that we have to change systems and that we hold each other accountable in this work. Okay, and the other document that I mentioned that we created is an anti-racist pledge. And so our team of seven who authored this document um, come from diverse backgrounds. Um, I feel lucky to work on a team that has representation of Black, Indigenous, people of color, um, as well as having um, white team members on our team. So we collectively wrote this and it is a living document for our team, but we're sharing a version with you so that you can see this in detail. Um, and it has four parts to it. Um, I'm not gonna read through all of them, but on the next couple of slides that Lila will go through for me, I'm just gonna read a couple of them. 
So this first section is our anti-racist culture. And so one of those is that we commit ourselves to recognizing and removing the racist actions and inactions that permeate the museum and our fields of study and work. And a second example is that we support one another in anti-racism work, knowing that we can't do this alone. The next section um, is our guiding principles of our anti-racist work. And you can see there in parentheses, we have another document that details how we do this work. So to be as specific as possible. So examples of that is that we commit to leading informed discussions about anti-racism in our spheres of influence, like this workshop. Um, and another example is that we are vocal and persistent about anti-racism and will not tolerate being silenced. So we do this work in our meetings, but also um, throughout the institution, uh, acknowledging when anti-racism comes up in other meetings that we're in. And then these last two sections were written in an acknowledgement that because we do have representation from both BIPOC members and white people on our team, um, that the experience around this work for both of those groups are different. Um, and so we wrote extra commitments for the non-Black or white people on our team. So two examples of those are that um, they do not expect gratitude, praise, promotion, or white allyship cookies for their anti-racist work. And that they'll lean into discomfort that they might experience during conversations about race and racism while being conscious of the harm uh, that racism in these discussions caused by PAC. And the last section are extra expectations for are the BIPOC people on our team. And two examples of that. <laughs> Thanks, Lula. I know I made a lot of slides. <laughs> um, one example of that is that we have space to be emotional and the right to step away from or refrain from contributing to harmful conversations. And that we know about race, uh, what we know about racism through lived experience is enough. We do not need to speak for or represent the experiences, needs, or values of all BIPOC. Thanks, Leila. And so that pledge um, is read out at the beginning of, of every anti-racist meeting, which means that we read every one of those every week. Um, and it's been really helpful in keeping us focused on this work. So just to kind of wrap up, we are still in the midst of it. It has um, been messy. It has been difficult. We've had hard conversations. Um, but we are moving on to our next steps. And so right now, that means that we are re-envisioning our partnerships through an anti-racist lens. And I saw that this came up in a lot of antidotes um, about what it means to work with partners kind of equitably and with inclusion. So right now we're creating a framework for working with partners that includes amongst other things, reflecting on our current partnerships and how we're planning for new ones. Um, and clearly stating how we prioritize re relationship building. It's not just that we prioritize it, but we're writing out actual statements on how or what that means and how we can do it. Um, and we're committing to ongoing evaluation from the start of a partnership, the middle of it, and if it eventually comes to an end, although we hope that we get to continue working with them. Um, and then we're also creating our guiding principles for how we work with partners which includes specific definitions or how we'll address mutual accountability, compensation, leadership, conflict resolution, self-reflection, and power dynamics. So again, it's been messy, it's been difficult, um, but that's what we've been doing so far. I'll pass it over to Jess. Okay, um, so some of this would have happened before I started working at the Natural History Museum in London, but um, especially in the last year, um, there has been a big push on championing diversity and it's now listed as one of our institution's core values. Um, but clearly it's all well and good having a core value, but it's actually about having the actions around that. So. Uh, um, there is a diversity and inclusion strategy now to, uh, until 2024. And I've listed there the four main um, objectives that our institution has um, to reach by 2024, to increase the visibility and understanding of diversity and inclusion, 
as critical to the museum's mission, achieving greater diversity in our workforce and leadership, continued to continue to provide opportunities for underrepresented groups to develop their careers and plan for inclusive succession and reduce the opportunity for bias throughout the employee life cycle. And have the next slide. So a lot of um, the work at the museum on these issues is carried out by the diversity working group, which has actually been in existence um, for some years, but they've been really a voluntary group from across the museum um, to champion equality, diversity and inclusion. And Sasha, I know, worked incredibly hard as part of this group. Um, oftentimes very frustratingly with very little action coming from it, but um, since last year and having diversity as one of our core values, this group is operating with increasing agency influence and direct impact and having many more conversations with our executive board and the diversity working group are an essential part of this new diversity and inclusion drive. Um, so they work to identify opportunities and priorities to support the embedding of diversity across the workforce and our public engagement. Um, and this group does have a, a lot of knowledge, passion and lived experience to bring to bear on their work. Um, and this year in particular, their governance and structure is being reformed to support greater efficacy and impact. And um, one of the ways in which this will manifest is by reapplying for an Athena Swan Bronze Award. Now, Athena Swan is a charter scheme that um, recognises the advancement of gender equality. So we're talking about representation, progress in and success for all. Um, for all. And this is a self-assessed charter that um, the museum was not successful in achieving in late 2018. And part of the reason for this was there was felt to be not enough data collected so I think, I, I can't remember the exact quote, but there's a, a, a quote by Bill Gates that this reminds me of around how you can't actually understand, um, you can't actually start to grapple a problem before you know its extent. So um, there's there was a real lack of data on um, these issues at the museum. And also um, it was felt for more, reflect, more reflective practice was, it was felt that more reflective practice was needed at the museum, like we're having, we've been having through the um, Learn Sit Sci project. So um, anyway, this is something that the museum is going to be pushing for this very year. Not to go for the next slide. And this is just a bit about what we've been working on specifically within citizen science, the citizen science team at the museum. Um, which is an ongoing piece of work, really. I know we've got a meeting in the next couple of weeks to review our progress, but we're looking at things like um, the paths to participation in our projects, whether there are enough avenues to um, for people to join projects rather than just having a one specific angle on a project. Are there different ways in which people can participate? We're also looking at the languages language and images on our website which come up time and time again as um, not being representative of um, diverse audiences. Um, there's a specific piece of work going on within our urban nature project which is a big strategic priority for the museum, the, the rebuilding of the museum's gardens, public gardens to, um, to open it out to more um, a more diverse audience and there's a stream of work in this on citizen science within this project that covers citizen science activities and we're really starting to engage with the different tiers of um, engagement in citizen science that there can be and increasing the number of levels at which people can participate in those activities. 
We're also looking at um, tools like such as the one that I provided a link for there that can help. This is on the EU citizen science platform that can help you to translate materials um, for citizen science projects. Um, and we're also constantly looking ways for ways to proactively engage with underrepresented groups and looking at our strategy, what we offer digitally, for example, especially over the last year when everybody's been at home, offering something where people can actually participate from their back garden is really important to us. And how we actually evaluate um, the inclusivity of our programmes is something we're working on as a, a priority. Next slide. Thanks, Jess and Michelle. Um, so now time for some questions. Um, and they could be questions specifically about what's happening at NHM LA or NHM London or about the Jamboard uh, or anything or any else. aspect of the workshop, yeah. <laughs> We've got about 10 minutes. That's a great amount of time. Lila, I'm interested in a question that was brought up earlier, I think, in the chat um, about um, feeling that these kinds of workshops are often preaching to the converted in a way. How, what's your impression of that? Yeah, well, we often preach to the choir, so to speak. I don't know if that's an yes, uh, idiom that you use in the UK much. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a lot of, I think someone else pointed out there's a lot of women on this call and with patriarchy being part of uh, the white supremacy culture um, characteristics. And so, you know, how do we get the people who need to hear this the most involved in these conversations? I think, it, personally, I think it goes back to that um, using our voice in the spheres of influence that we have, especially as a white woman who's in... Uh, middle-ish, upper middle-ish management. Mm. Uh, and so I frequently am a squeaky wheel in meetings with vice president um, from my department. It's exhausting. I know that that's not surprising to many of you folks who are BIPOC, um, but I feel like that's part of my job at, with my white privilege is to kind of just keep doing that in the spaces I'm in. Um, so yeah, I think that sphere of influence piece. Jesse, I, I could see you dying to say something. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, I also, and I put it in the chat too, but I also wanted to acknowledge that it, it, I feel like it's a little bit self-serving saying that it's only people who want to change who are in these meetings. And it's usually a lot of either like white women or just lighter, you know, white passing women like myself who kind of say this when least with past meetings, even within our own institution. And I, I don't know if you were in with that with me, Leela, but like they tend, a lot of people tend to hijack it because of the defensiveness and their feelings. And I do think that when we say that people who don't want to learn aren't coming to these meetings and that people who learn come to these meetings, I think it tends to also negate that sometimes a lot of this um, white supremacy culture is perpetuated by liberal organizations or by people who are very much on the left and who are just as toxic or just as, as um, upholding the same culture. And so I do want to acknowledge that as well. Thanks, Jesse. Yeah. Okay, we do have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, can you give us any insight, Leela, into where um, how we came across this source from the Minnesota Historical Society and how widely it's accepted. Because I know that's a resource that you shared with us. And I... Is that the white supremacy culture characteristics? Yeah. For some reason, I thought that was Texas. Um, uh, yeah, Jesse, was that you? I know, well, we'd been having discussions in our office for a long time about white supremacy culture 
and I think I remember it coming up in some of my white people for black lives uh, trainings that I'd gone to as part of that org that again that was in my personal time outside of work um, and then sharing it with folks on our uh, in our office and having again we have space in our weekly team meetings before we had an anti-racist meeting for discussions around these things so it helped us to be able to jump into this work very quickly because we'd all been talking and we were all like Jesse and Michelle and Miguel from our office and Amy and Mays um, and others, we would frequently be sharing resources. And so I think that this came out from that. And yeah, we do get a lot of pushback from, I've had, I posted, I've been posting it on Facebook a couple of years ago and one white gentleman saying, what, so this is just everything now? I'm like, well, that's kind of the point. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I think there, there's, there has been a lot of pushback. Uh, I haven't heard any specific pushback from executives in our museum, but also maybe they just haven't said it out loud. And Tina is asking whether we, any of our organizations brought in a diversity expert to facilitate this work or was it organic from existing staff? And I can tell you from the London side that there was no diversity expert brought in. It's all been staff led. So institutionally at our museum, there is an expert uh, that has been brought in um, working with executive staff and with our president. Um, and there is an internal working group. I think it's called the internal working group. I think that's literally the name IWG. Uh, there's been, in our office, we have not worked with any um, consultants. We, we feel like we know the museum the best and we know our work the best and we have started doing this work. Um, and institutionally, there is work happening in this realm, but we knew that we had to do something within our office. And we haven't been told to stop, but we haven't exactly asked permission either. Um, Chris, have a, go ahead. Chris is asking, how do you make sure that your team works towards equity and justice, not just diversity? Because some people seem to be making the changes for optics more than a more deeply meaningful reason. So how do you push for equality and justice first? Any thoughts, Lila? Well, I, I don't want it to just be me. So if anyone Michelle? else on the team. Jesse? Yeah, I, I can speak specifically for the work that we've been doing within our office. Um, I think institutionally, um, other approaches are being taken to make sure that it's not just diversity. Um, but I think that for our team, we, are maybe even more focused on the justice and equity portion of that um, because our team does have representation from the BIPOC community and we have white people on our team. Um, for us, it's about making sure that we're amplifying the voices of the BIPOC members of our team, that we amplify the voices of our partners, the people that we're working with. Um, we are reaching out to partners and community that we haven't worked with before. Um, and so our focus focus really has been on justice and equity and not so much about, you know, making sure and not even just picking the partners that like will hit a certain, certain demographic, um, but really, really hearing those voices and incorporating it and changing the work that we do with those responses in mind. Um, because it really isn't just about the optics for us or like the picture for us, but really just how do those voices literally change the way that we work. But I know that it is a lot about optics for institutions, museums in general, um, non large nonprofits. It's very much about optics. And one of the one of the foundational readings uh, was actually a, a visual uh, graphic that uh, someone had shared on Instagram about um, optical allyship versus uh, um, authentic allyship. 
Um, and I know mm -hmm. I also want to just highlight that allyship as a term is is complicated and some folks are like, mm, is it about allyship or about more about comradeship? Because allyship could seem to be something that you're standing on the sidelines. Um, can you call yourself an ally or is that a name given to you, identity? So the, there's a lot in there, but the optics, I think, and that's a lot about, I think, what institutions do. And I think museums do it a lot. Jesse. Yeah, I sorry, my dog's just going a little rambunctious, but I wanted to actually also address and call out um, that our office has been able to focus on justice and equity a lot more because of the leadership in the community that we have in our office and our team. Um, way more so than I would say the larger museum where I think that plays a big role in the willingness and the openness of that leadership to like not only to take feedback but also to be vulnerable and not be defensive and allow conversations like this to flourish because even before the protest with George Floyd's, we've been having conversations surrounding anti-racism, you know, since I, I, I feel like since I started the position three years ago, um, it just wasn't in a formal setting. Um, so being able to have that type of culture also set the foundation to where we are at now. Whereas with the larger institution as a museum, it's a lot slower and a lot further behind, um, but it is hopefully on its process of getting there. So uh, there's a few last slides. Um, we have a program survey that we would love for you all to take um, to help us improve this. We are submitting a, um, we submitted a proposal for the Citizen Science Association here in the US to do a similar version, uh, but changed and improved. Clearly improving the Jamboard uh, function. Um, it will be one of the things that we will we will work on. Um, but if you could do that survey, it would be fantastic and very helpful to us. We will be sending out a follow-up email um, to you all with, oops, that is not the slide that we wanted. Um, we will be sending out a follow-up email uh, to you all with the recording of this uh, session, um, the slide deck, the link to the Jamboard, so you can keep adding to the Jamboard if you would like. Um, we know that some folks really like that because there, there's an anonymous function. If you were on here with like maybe your uh, supervisor, um, that can be uh, an issue working in the Google Doc where you can see everyone's names. Um, and uh, yeah, I just wanted to close with this Angela Davis quote. Uh, it's her birthday yesterday. Um, you've been, a, oh dear, you've been an activist for decades. Um, what keeps you going? Uh, do you think we should remain optimistic about the future? Well, I don't think we have any alternative than other than remaining optimistic. Optimism is an absolute necessity, even if it's only optimism of the will, as a Gramsci said, and pessimism of the intellect. What has kept me going has been the development of new modes of community. I don't know whether I would have survived had not movements survived, had not communities of resistance, communities of struggle. So thanks everyone for joining yeah. us this morning. We've reached five o'clock, stroke nine o'clock <laughs> in Los Angeles. Thank you all for coming. We'd love to carry on the conversation. Um, Sorry. Love to see if we can um, keep the jam board going. Yeah, the jam. Your your input to the jam boards has been incredibly insightful. Thank you for getting involved there. And again, please, um, the survey, we absolutely um, want constructive and critical feedback. Um, if you feel like you have the energy to do that, that's great. If you feel like you have the mental, emotional bandwidth to do that, that's great. Uh, we also understand if you don't, um, but we really do appreciate uh, critical feedback so we can 
continue to do this work and continue to make it um, better. <laughs>